I wanted to talk about rolling with slipping. So we've done all of chapter 11 rolling without slipping, um, but the reason I want to talk about this now is because this could be an AP test topic. It's a great little um, um, thing that they would do to ask questions about what if questions. Uh, but I'm going to go through the mathematical treatment as well just so that you understand the concept because um, that'd be something that we would normally discuss in chapter 11. So rolling with slipping. All right. So uh, the concept here is, remember we said for an object to um, change its rotational state, friction has to be involved. Usually that friction is static friction, right? And so a change in rotational state for a rolling object needs friction. Okay, so if this is rolling without slipping, that friction is static friction. And if it's rolling without slipping, remember there's a necessary link between the velocity of the center of mass of the object and the rate of rotation of the object, as um, uh, including the outermost radius of that object, and uh, of the center of mass's acceleration and the rate at which the rotational rate is changing, right? Those are the conditions of pure rolling. But when we have rolling uh, with slipping, the static friction, rather the friction involved, is going to be a kinetic friction because the point of contact is going to be slipping past um, the ground in some way, shape, or form. And we'll talk about all those way, shapes, or forms. And so the most important thing is that um, during the slipping phase, notice I say slipping phase because that's going to have an interesting implication in a second there is no link between the center of mass motion and the rotation, okay? So that's the critical idea here. So let's just look at something that is rolling, uh, or just, let's just, uh, here we go. I'll just get to draw an object and we'll talk about it. Okay, we'll talk about various things that roll with slipping. So one thing that might roll with slipping is something, so situation one, uh, that starts out in pure translation. Okay, meaning just the center of mass has a velocity. Okay. So something that starts out in pure, like, so the, the example, the classic example of that might be a bowling ball. If you roll a bowling ball, um, initially it only has translational motion unless you're talented and know how to hook, curve, and whatever the ball. Most of us don't have that talent. We just make the ball go forward, right? And so if we're looking at that in that situation, point P here also has a velocity that's equal to the velocity of the center of mass. So point P is moving to the right with respect to the ground. So this object would experience a kinetic friction to the left. Now, let's talk, uh, and I just wanna talk theoretically about this stuff. We'll get to the math later. Um, let's talk about what uh, happens in this, in this perspective. So initially in this situation, omega initial is zero, and v com is whatever the v com is. All right, so notice here we have a kinetic frictional force. What is that kinetic frictional force gonna do? Notice here that the kinetic friction is opposite uh, v com. That means that a com is going to be opposite v com. And that's gonna mean that the velocity of the center of mass is going to decrease since the acceleration of the center of mass is opposite of it. But also notice, um, when uh, thinking about torques, here we have to, and this is so critical, with rolling with slipping, during the slipping phase, we have to use the center of mass as our pivot. The only reason we were able to use point P as our pivot in the rolling with slipping without slipping problems was there was a mathematical equivalence 
between an object rotating about its center of mass and translating as uh, to an object that is just in pure rotation about a point on its end. And we showed that mathematical equivalence, but that mathematical equivalence was a, a condition of static friction, a condition of no slipping. That doesn't work here. So I have to use the center of mass as my rotational axis. So must use COM as the pivot. Because remember, an object is going to, without constraint, is always going to use its center of mass as its pivot. The whole concept here is there's no constraint because they're slipping. So with that little diatribe, um, notice here that FK is going to produce a clockwise torque. Oh, well, we would assume that if an object is translating uh, to the right, that if it was in pure rolling, it would be uh, rotating clockwise. So what happens here is alpha is clockwise, therefore omega increases in a clockwise fashion. So notice here, I start out as omega zero, and I start out as vcom as vcom. This is getting smaller, that's getting larger. If I go back up to this, remember this equivalence doesn't exist here, but if you think about it, vcom is decreasing while the omega r is increasing over time. At some point, the graphs of omega r, which started out at zero, and vcom are gonna cross. Except when they cross, what ends up happening is the, th the, the, the system goes into pure rolling. So VCOM is going to decrease because of ACOM, whereas omega is going to increase because of alpha. And at some point, VCOM will equal the, the product of omega R. And at that point, it goes into pure rolling. Every rolling with slipping poor, uh, uh, problem eventually, uh, given enough time, right? If there's some other constraint in the problem um, that like say this, the kinetic friction only lasts for a certain portion of time, uh, this doesn't, uh, doesn't gel, but eventually becomes pure rolling. So we can use that notion in order to figure out like when uh, this phase stops. Um, and it should be noted, when you get to pure rolling, friction goes away entirely because the object will have no reason to accelerate at that point. And so it just gets to pure rolling and then rolls at a constant velocity from there. Remember, if I'm rolling with a constant velocity, there is no frictional force. The frictional force only occurs during changes in rotational state. So that's situation one, an object in pure translation. Situation two, let's say I have an object that's in pure rotation. Okay, uh, so what that means is vcom is equal to zero. So say for example, you um, uh, get a ball spinning like that, All right? So I get a ball spinning or uh, I take a tire wheel somehow and I spin the tire wheel and then I drop it on the ground. Well, what ends up happening when I drop that on the ground is it's spinning like this, there's no vcom. So if you think about it, the point of contact is moving uh, in that direction with respect to the ground, and therefore kinetic friction is going to be in this direction, right? So point P is slipping to the left, therefore kinetic friction acts to the right. So what happens here? Well, the VCOM is going to start at zero, but notice here, ACOM will be uh, to the right, and there, therefore VCOM increases to the right. But simultaneously, if that's the center of mass and that's my axis of rotation, omega is initially omega i. And what happens to that? Well, here there's going to be a, so omega initial is clockwise, but alpha is going to be counterclockwise. Therefore, omega initial or omega decreases over time. 
O, it decreases over time until that same thing happens. Here, kind of the opposite thing happens where VCOM was zero and is increasing, but the product of omega R was uh, some value here, and it decreases until those two graphs cross, and then I get that uh, it snaps into pure rolling. So it's very similar to situation one. All right, let's look at situation three, backspin. So this is weird because, say for example, VCOM is forward, um, and we would expect then that uh, for an object in pure rolling, if, uh, let's say to the right forward, um, if VCOM was to the right, then an object would be spinning clockwise, but omega initial is counterclockwise, and that's what backspin looks like. So here we go. So there's omega initial, and here's VCOM. All right? And so if we look at that scenario and see, well, what's happening uh, there? Well, interestingly enough, because of the translation of the object, it would seem, well, wouldn't point P be moving to the right? Uh, but due to the, uh, the, the, hold on a second, is that, is that my backspin? Yeah, that's backspin. Um, with that backspin, um, we also have um, point P moving to the right there. Hold on a second, let me just think through this for half a second. Um, Yeah, good. So, so due to the backspin, if I just consider the backspin, point P is moving to the right. If I'm just considering the translation, point P is moving to the right, meaning that kinetic friction here is going to be uh, uh, to the left. So from there, if we look at what's happening, um, it looks like VCOM is going to decrease its motion to the right. And similarly, we're going to have uh, omega uh, decrease its motion as well because the torque would be um, uh, the torque here would be clockwise. The weird thing about backspin is uh, we don't know where that intersection point would be because uh, depending on how big each of these are uh, and some other factors that you'll see in the math like um, this initially on this graph would have a negative, let's say, you know, to the right is positive and clockwise is positive. This would have a negative connotation and this would have a initial positive connotation. Uh, this could be such that um, that's what it looks like, which would mean that um, VCOM decreases so much that it stops and, in, and then finally the object is moving backwards while in pure rolling or uh, the backspin could not be that significant, in which case the backspin ends pretty quickly um, and, and ends up going forward with a forward spin, or they could meet at the axis and the object could just stop. It we can't say deterministically without knowing the initial conditions where what this uh, motion would look like finally when it got to the point of um, uh, pure rolling. It would just be a function of these things. But those would be our initial conditions for the backspin. And our last situation that we, we can deal with is the uh, topspin. Uh, topspin is sort of a really interesting situation because topspin, um, we would have VCOM is forward as well. So VCOM is forward. Uh, and omega initial is clockwise. Um, but it's, it's such that, and this is why it's slipping, that um, VCOM uh, would mean that point P, because of its translation, would move to the right. But because of this, um, point P is trying to move to the, to the left, right? So um, this is wanting point P to move to the right. Um, this is wanting P point P to move to the left. So we don't know which of those two is bigger when I've got topspin. So what I would have to look at is VCOM versus the velocity of that point, which is omega initial capital R. And I would have to compare from the initial condition which of those is bigger to know whether point P slips to the left or to the right to know what the direction of friction is. 
and I would first figure out what the initial velocity of point P is so I would know how to put my friction on the diagram before going back, right? But the whole point is, uh, once you establish the friction, we know that um, these two terms are going to, the Vcom and the omega uh, r, are going to come to some sort of meeting point in the middle. So now what I want to do is go back to uh, situation one, the pure translation, and actually show you the uh, solution pattern for this. It is unlikely that they would ask you to replicate this on the AP exam because they are not focusing on um, um, uh, calculations so much as they are focusing on ideas. I wanted to make sure we went through all the ideas about what's happening with rolling with slipping because uh, those are really important ideas in order to figure out what's going on. So let's look at this. Um, starting in pure translation. So what does my free body diagram look like? Well, my free body diagram looks like we know it's translating uh, to the right. So that means that friction and its kinetic friction is to the left. I've got normal force. I've got force of gravity. Now, in terms of the solution pattern, it's really important that our declarations are linked. We wanna think about what do we think is gonna be the end state of this? I think the end state of this because uh, I know the initial velocity, so vi com is forward initially. I know that the um, uh, finally this thing is going to be rolling forward. So I want to make to the right positive. Um, the next thing I want to do is I want to think about, well, if an object is in pure rolling going to the right, what would be the direction of its rotation? That would be clockwise. And I want to make those two things linked in terms of my um, uh, declarations. And I'm just going to say up is positive for sake of argument here. I can't emphasize enough how important linked declarations are for solving this problem. So here we go. Um, by the way, I don't know if this is a disc, a hoop, or whatnot, but what I can say is that I here for this object is gonna be mr squared, where r is the outside radius of it, and then I'm just gonna put a factor q in front of this. Because if you think about it, if it's a hoop, q is one. If it's a disc, q is a half. If it's a, a sphere, a solid sphere, Q is two fifths. If it's a hollow sphere, Q is uh, two, uh, two thirds, right? So most things that we can think about have that form. This allows me to do a slightly more general solution here. So from there, what am I gonna do? Well, here's the thing. What sort of analysis would I wanna do? I don't wanna do an energy analysis because I don't know enough about the final state of the object to be able to, to, to link two points. And I know there's a non-conservative force that's actually doing work here, but figuring out how much work this uh, force does is actually really tricky uh, from an energy perspective. Um, because I would need to know how many times this thing rotates past this point. Like I would need to know like the motion of point P as a function in order to figure out the work done here. And that's really, really tragic. So I'm not gonna do that. Especially, remember, because there's a disjunction between the translation and the rotation, so that can get tricky pretty qu quickly. I can do a work energy analysis at the end by just doing initial kinetic energy to final kinetic energy, That's in, that's a, or final minus initial kinetic energies in order to figure out the work done by that force. That's easy, but an energy analysis is not the way to go. Now, I will tell you, there is a weird angular momentum way of doing this, but we're not gonna do it the angular momentum way uh, yet, because uh, that's sort of a trick. Uh, I just wanna show you the easiest way to do this is with torques and forces. So if I do this, sum of forces in the uh, y direction is equal to MAY, uh, FN minus FG is equal to zero, Fn is equal to mg. I just need to have that uh, in my back pocket then. Sum of forces in the x is equal to max. Now I said to the right is positive, so I have a negative fk is equal to max. Let's go down another level on that. Negative mu fn, right? So mu k mg is equal to max. Dan, do it, right? Ma, the m's go away. I got negative mu kg is equal to ax. All right, cool. Nice and simple there. Um, notice I don't need any limit statements here because FK doesn't have a limit. FK is just FK. So I now have an expression for the acceleration of the center of mass. Awesome, it's negative. Good initial velocity is positive. That's gonna decrease that as we talked about that. Now, I'm gonna do a sum of torques about the center of mass 
and that's going to equal I about the center of mass, alpha. The only thing causing a torque is Fk, and it's a positive torque due to uh, kinetic friction, and that's going to equal uh, I about the center of mass, alpha. So what's that? That's Fk times the R, which is the outermost radius of this object. Why do I keep saying outermost radius? If I have a weird object that's like a spool, has an inner radius and an outer radius, I care about the outer radius because that's where the point of contact is being made. And this is equal to QMR squared alpha. Great, let's do some substitutions. This is equal to mu K M G R is equal to QMR squared alpha. <gasps> yep, masses go away and one of the radii go away, but a radius still matters. So how big this radius is matters to the end result. Now, remember, in this step, this is where in the rolling width slipping, we would start linking these two things. We can't link these two things because the center of mass acceleration and the alpha only are linked when I am rolling without slipping. I'm slipping here. There's no link. Okay, just had to say that. So that means I've got, uh, let's see, mu uh, k g over q r is equal to alpha. All right, what do I do with that? Well, what I'm going to do with that is kinematics, actually. Because what I want to do now is, a, is use the condition of pure rolling because I know that the slipping phase ends when it goes into pure rolling. And why can I use kinematics? Look at these two terms. Constants. Beautiful. So here we go. Um, I've got that. I've got that. Uh, so let's do, um, okay, just let's pick a nice easy one. The F. So that's VF com is equal to VI plus A uh, T. And we'll use the correlated um, rotational omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha T. And we'll realize here VI is that VI com, so that's staying. Um, VF is VF for the moment. A is this expression. Okay, so let's do this. So VF is equal to VI minus mu. Uh, k, G, T. Now remember, F, K could be in all sorts of different directions based on what the initial condition is. V, I could have all different uh, values um, based on what the initial conditions are. So the sign of this and the sign of this are going to change based on initial conditions. What goes in the initials here is going to change based on initial conditions. So don't think that this is the solution um, answer for all conditions. This is the solution methodology, though, of considering uh, sum of forces, sum of torques, and then kinematics, uh, both linear and rotational, and then linking them. That solution methodology is the thing that we want to hold on to. So we know in this particular instance, uh, omega initial is zero, and then I can put in place here mu k g over q r t. So what are we going to do from here? Well, two things. The first thing we're going to do is going to, we're going to realize that V final is equal to omega final capital R, right? Because we know that the slipping phase ends, that's what our final is when the slipping phase ends, when we get to pure rolling. Okay, cool. So now we can link these two things together. So I get that V I minus mu k g t is equal to parentheses mu k g over q r um, t times r. All right, cool. Oh, there goes our r. And what do we have then? Well, we have v i minus mu, that's mu k, mu k g t is equal to mu k g t over q. All right, let's bring, uh, which, let's, let's solve for t, that seems to make sense. So v i is equal to mu k g t uh, plus mu k g t over q. I just want to kind of get this into one term just to make it a little bit neater. v i uh, actually, let's multiply both sides by Q. Maybe that's going to be the easiest thing to do. Yeah, VIQ is equal to then uh, 
mu k g t q um, plus mu k g t. And so therefore I could factor out the t and get that my time that I'm in the slipping phase is v i q over mu k g q plus one, right? Because this factors out to t, um, uh, t, whoops, yeah, that's right. This factors, we can factor out a mu k g t here and have a q plus one term. Oh, hold on a second, that's what it is. Uh, sorry, t mu k g q plus one, there it is. And so t, let's make this nicer, v i q over um, mu k g q plus one. So that remember that q plus one, or this, this is gonna be a function of what the shape of the object is. These are not a function of what the shape of the object is. So from there, um, I could use that t in order to find out what the final rotational rate is. I could use that to find out what the final speed is. Let's actually do that. So what is the speed this thing has when it gets into pure rolling? It's vi minus mu kg, and then this t is vi q over mu kg q plus one. Oh wow, the mu kgs cancel. I've got uh, it's vi minus q over q plus one uh, vi, right? And so just to give you a flavor, let's say that I have a hoop. Uh, that would be q is equal to one, right? So that would be equal to vi minus one over two vi. Oh, uh, the final velocity would be half if. Uh, it was a disc, and the uh, disc q is a half. A half over three halves is one third, so I'd end up with um, uh, two thirds of vi, right? So there you go, a general solution for that problem. That's how it all kind of comes together. Um, there's a lot of interesting uh, side analysis that you can do with that in terms of energies then. Uh, I did wanna show you uh, the trick though, and it's an angular momentum trick. So, uh, I've never really been able to explain exactly why this works um, to my uh, personal satisfaction. Let's assume angular momentum is conserved. And you're like, wait a sec, it's not because there's that uh, frictional force that acts. Um, right, so let's say we consider that frictional force there as, a, um, uh, um, as an internal force. You're like, uh, Mr. Ron, you can't do that. And I say, like, ah, just, go with me, let's pretend that I can do that. Because let's pretend I'm choosing that is my pivot point. And you're gonna to say to me, but it's that's not my pivot point. Well, hold on a second. If we consider this to be the type of problem like the uh, colliding free objects where we use the pivot point as um, uh, a certain point, what happens after we're done with all of this this could make sense. Because we know when we're done with this thing that this is in pure rolling, right? And when you're in pure rolling, we can use this as the pivot point. So in that perspective, what we can do is we can think of, okay, well, what's the initial angular momentum if this is the pivot point? Well, this object's not rotating, so it would not have a rotational term, but it is translating. So about about the pivot point here, its initial angular momentum would be mvi capital R because uh, we'd be treating this as a point mass moving in a straight line a distance r above the ground. But then finally, we're not gonna treat it like that. We're gonna treat it like um, a point rotating about its edge, which it is if it's in pure rolling. So what can we do with that? Well, we can just use uh, I final, uh, omega final, and that would be I of, let's say this is a hoop, I have a hoop about its edge, which would be um, mR squared plus the shifting factor mR squared omega final. Uh, so if we do that out, I've got mVIR is equal to two mR squared omega final. Uh, M's cancel, one of the R's cancel. Let's uh, um, then remember, so VI 
uh, is equal to 2r omega final. Um, oh, but omega final is equal to uh, v final over r, because the condition of pure rolling is fine. And so vi is equal to 2r over v final over r. Okay, the r's cancel. Oh my god, look at that. We got vf is equal to 1 half vi, which is exactly what we got for the hoop here. So that's the analysis that works, is that you can consider angular momentum as being conserved in this process, but what you have to do is the initial condition, you have to pick the appropriate things for Li. If the object has translation, you need an MVR term. If it's got rotation, it needs an I omega term. Uh, and you do that about center of mass, um, or talking about the motion of the center of mass. But for LF, you just treat it as a point rotating about its edge using the parallaxis theorem to find omega final, uh, which we can then replace with VF over R um, because we know we're in pure rolling in a final situation. So I've never been comfortable with that analysis because um, people want to say, well, throughout this motion, I'm not using the same pivot point. My argument is always that, well, at the end, my pivot point is where that frictional force would act, which is why it's not a net external torque, which is why we can do that. But like I said, uh, it feels a little bit of a weak argument, and I've never been able to explain it adequately to, uh, to my satisfaction. But that is a trick that works, and it's much quicker uh, than all that analysis that I showed you before.